Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have a special guest with us, uh, GM Bailey. He's a writer, he's an editor, he's a literary critic, he's a former professor, and he's most well known for the People's Linguistic Survey of India. Um, we're going to discuss Mahatma Gandhi, whose uh, uh, birth anniversary is celebrated on 2nd of October. And uh, let's begin. Welcome to the program, Mr. Devi. Very, very happy to have you here. Uh, and it's an, also an important occasion, uh, which uh, on 2nd October, it's almost like a habit that we recall uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, but I've always been curious, why is it that during times of conflict, violence, protests, that is when we remember Gandhi the most. Could you try, try to talk, talk about why that is so? Well, um, if you think of Gandhi's uh, life itself, it, uh, it uh, begins uh, in uh, times of great uh, tension, international tension between Germany and England. Uh, then comes the, I mean, there is the naval competition and clashes. Then comes the Boer War. He was part of the war. I mean, he, he became, uh, he held the British government there. Uh, the First World War, uh, so many, uh, several uh, epidemics, uh, plagues he had to face. He, in one, he worked as a volunteer. In the second, he himself uh, suffered from the uh, epidemic. Uh, then, uh, of course, comes the Second World War. I mean, he was he lived through the from the beginning to the end. Uh, in fact, when Gandhi becomes uh, the uh, most eminent uh, uh, votary of uh, uh, nonviolence, that is after the Dandi March, which is in April 1931. That's uh, just about two years before. That is April 1933. That Hitler came to power. And Mussolini was already in the saddle uh, eight years ago, eight years before that. And from that time on, uh, if uh, you were to imagine the headlines of newspapers, they're about uh, how uh, how uh, Rommel uh, uh, attacked uh, the you know Egypt the in Egypt the Allies, uh, how uh, several uh, uh, naval uh, uh, convoys were sunk. Uh, a convoy carrying about 4,000 cars, vehicles sunk and disappears for eight weeks or 10 weeks. Now, uh, Gandhi's time was a time of riots, wars, epidemics, and a time of misery. It is not like Gandhi was doing tapasharya in some very peaceful forest. He was in the middle of the... And therefore, we remember Gandhi. Because in those dark times, Gandhi kept the hope alive. Even when he, uh, for instance, when he uh, declared uh, uh, Bharat, uh, the, the, the Quit India movement, which was named by Yusuf Mahirali as Quit India, uh, uh, a month before the movement started in August 1942. Uh, in July 42, Gandhi held a meeting at Varda and passed four resolutions to start such an andolan, such, an, such a movement. And the, uh, the second resolution is of, of the four most important things for him in the year 1942, the second resolution was we must fight all forms of fascism wherever and whenever it becomes necessary. So here is a man who is actually confronting fascism, not just colonialism. Uh, he is confronting violence all the time. How many times uh, attempts were made on his life? I mean, in the last attempt, that attempt becomes uh, uh, nefariously successful. But there are six other attempts when, and it's not just in India, and it's not just when he became eminent. Even in South Africa, there is an attempt on his life two, two twice, and then later in India. Uh, and this is several years before 1948 that people wanted to kill him. Uh, so people, I mean, the princes were against him. Uh, they uh, actually actively helped the uh, killers. Uh, the Hindu uh, Mahasabha was against him. Uh, there were then the uh, people who did not agree with his path and wanted uh, a militant uh, uh, resistance. 
they were against him and people who were with him themselves did not understand the spirit of non violence fully because for gandhi non violence was not an action or absence of action non violence was a philosophical philosophical acceptance of not having greed as a part of life I mean, he had accepted that idea from the Jain philosophy uh, of a parigra. He mentions it in the, the Hind Swaraj. A parigra uh, is, uh, the, I mean, at the end of the uh, that book, Hind Swaraj, there are several resolutions. He says these are the things we need to do, and one is we must repent for where we are, and out of that repentance, our action must be, and our action must be held. Uh, on the solid platform of non acquisition a parigra uh, gandhi argued that uh, desire to to hold to grab to to uh, possess uh, is the mother is the birth uh, genesis of violence so gandhi's non violence was not understood by others in his times and his times were the most violent times and that's why gandhi was a great person he was not uh, supplying Uh, what was already available as a philosophy he was producing a philosophy in times where there was a great want of non violence the moment you mention hind swaraj i am reminded of his home state gujarat which is treading a path which is very different from the uh, kind of ideals gandhi espouses in that book at that time there is a development which is ostensibly based on technology there is a mall culture uh there are attacks on minorities there are attacks on dalits which have been going on for a very long time in the state why is it that the state where gandhi was born and lived the state the site of his activism has become uh has traveled very far from what he believed yeah we i mean we uh, we cannot think of gujarat just as the state that took birth in 1960 of the linguistic states were created in india uh it belonged to the bombay presidency and that that bombay presidency spread all the way from nagpur to karachi now uh, in those times in particularly in 1920s uh, just as gandhi took charge of the congress which he did in 1921 after the uh, decline of tilak lala lajpat rai uh, and bipin chandra pal gandhi became the leader in the same year uh, munje Uh, had uh, uh, barrister munje another barrister had uh, conceptualized the hindu mahasabha and the rss took birth out of you know the, the this hindu mahasabha and rss they started working now their ideas uh, had emerged from a frustrated generation post the peshwa rule in maharashtra particularly the brahmins uh, the peshwa rule declined in 1818 and through the 19th century the frustration kept mounting uh, finally uh, bring uh, coming to a kind of uh, boiling point in 1890s when tilak uh, wrote his uh, a book a little booklet called the uh, the uh, the uh, nordic home of the aryans now the aryan supremacy idea came up brahmin supremacy idea came etc etc right what happened is after independence the the monetary help for these ideas came from baniyas the merchant class and bombay was in the 1960s very rapidly industrializing it did not remain a city of merchants it never was but it ceased to be a city of merchants it was a city of industrial workers or industrial owners the merchants were from surat from baroda from bhavnagar and so uh, patronage to rss ideas monetary patronage to rss ideas was drawn from gujarat so many of the uh, pracharaks of rss house themselves in gujarat for instance narendra modi was a pracharak i mean he, he was born in gujarat but he had deserted gujarat or his family had deserted him i don't know exactly which but uh, uh, he was out of gujarat but as a pracharak he went back to gujarat in baroda he was in baroda in in 1980s and uh, uh, so many manmohan vaidya uh, from maharashtra uh, uh, went to gujarat as a pracharak and so 
the pracha gujarat became the uh, the uh, kind of um, crucible for the pracharaks that means the money the ideas had initially come from savarkar hedgewar golwalkar uh, and from nagpur and also from uh, yeah, banaras uh, but uh, because there was a time when rss was run from banaras just for uh, for some years uh, but the uh, monetary help came and the training hostels and training schools were built in gujarat at outside amdavad there are places where hundreds of rss workers go get trained not hundreds thousands can stay there the large campuses and uh, uh, th therefore gujarat became ready for the uh, for housing uh, providing hospitality for rss now uh, why did it become a laboratory for uh, for reason is in gujarat the charitable nature of the people there despite being rich prosperous people had been charitable uh, because of their religious background jainism vaishnavism so okay. giving was top one's life and, and even very rich people in gujarat remained quite simple unlike in another state like punjab there was no no uh, gaudy show of their wealth they spent money in giving uh, to uh, where it was necessary uh, as a result of that no left party ever took root in gujarat so gujarat had only congress party whereas if you think of other states say bengal there was the or orissa there was the congress and there was at least a faction coming out of the congress in orissa uh, or in Telang what is telangana now or a left party in the bengal or left party in, or there was a socialist party praja psp or whatever janta party in maharashtra gujarat had only one party and so congress and uh, it had uh, uninterrupted uh, 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 regime there uh, to create an alternate party became easiest in gujarat it may in future become that much easy in orissa perhaps now because there is no other party the, there was no second so the bjp decided to gujarat had money gujarat had pracharaks and gujarat is a relatively small state uh, though its uh, economy is large its uh, geographical area is also large but actually ha habitation of gujarat is much uh, while the population of maharashtra today is about uh, 12 to 14 uh, 14 crores uh, population of gujarat is still at about 7 crores half the size so it is it has a, it had fewer districts uh, when modi was uh, in gujarat gujarat had uh, something like 22 districts so it was easier to manage there was no second party money was there pracharaks were there and the business people did not really mind who was in power business people uh, were okay uh, with whoever was in power uh, had they been nice to the business community for all these reasons uh, there is one last reason and uh, that is uh, during the jp movement gujarat suddenly became very violent and uh, that violence was not sorted out nicely it was suppressed the uh, it was also the time when influx of people started going to gujarat uh, for uh, employment and that generated uh, animosity uh, towards those from outside uh, gujarat did not have a historically any hero like uh, rajasthan had uh, rana pratap maharashtra shivaji to turn back to, to say yes we were also heroic uh, gujaratis were teased by outsiders as gujus and that was an insult and so they always felt that they people laugh at them while they are producing wealth uh, they feel that they were being seen as cowards uh, all hindi cinema showed gujarati characters as co very cowardly and that and that that hurt since the bjp used it and finally the dietary habits of gujaratis are uh, very uh, snobbish uh, they uh, claim to be vegetarians when they are in uh, with somebody 
and they uh, they quite enjoy eating non vegetarian food so this vegetarianism had to be publicly declared uh, which means in every locality housing society uh, those who openly say they were non vegetarian were disallowed and muslims therefore came first on the target because of this diet thing then the muslims had uh, gujarat developed the first uh, major refinery in india ipcl uh, which later was uh, was was literally stolen by uh, ambani from the government at a very throwaway price the petrol uh, ongc and ipcl petrol had made transportation a very flourishing business in gujarat when petrol was at 4 rupees a liter or i mean those were very distant times in history thousands of years ago petrol used to be 20 rupees a liter so uh, so uh, the uh, transport business uh, came under the control of the muslims and that had to be wrested away from them that's that was the feeling so all these reasons came together and provided uh, an opportunity uh, this is a classic case of you know hitler rose uh, because of unemployment and poverty and depression uh, here uh, a dictatorial mind came to power because of affluence because of lack of employment because of excessive consumerism uh, because of dulled sensibilities of the people so you're saying that in some senses what gandhi epitomized and what gujarat became uh, had to be opposites of each other gandhi was born in gujarat but was gandhi born of gujarat similarly modi was born in gujarat but whether modi was modi is born of gujarat uh, these are questions that need to be sorted out gandhi um, uh, uh, tried to translate plato into gujarati uh, Gandhi accepted Ruskin. Uh, Gandhi uh, uh, read uh, deeply into Bible as well as Quran. Uh, Gandhi was a great admirer of Gautam Buddha. So Gandhi gathered his uh, ideas from all over, the, uh, and of course, the uh, the nineteenth uh, century the American philosophers inspired Gandhi. Emerson was a, uh, and so was Tolstoy, Gandhi's friend. Absolutely. So Emerson, Tolstoy, Ruskin, Plato, Buddha, uh, Bhagavad Gita, the uh, Gandhi's most favorite Upanishad was uh, uh, the, uh, the Isha Upanishad, the Upanishads, all of those fell into Gandhi Joli, the mentor. He gathered all of this. He took the very best from the rest of the world. He was born in Gujarat. But he cannot be characterized as a Gujarati thinker. Similarly, uh, Modi is born in Gujarat. But Modi's gathered stuff from Adolf Hitler, uh, Benito Mussolini, from the uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the more recent uh, African and Asian dictators. Uh, he his ideological uh, uh, supply supply line. Um, is from Nagpur and not from Ahmedabad. Modi was not inspired by Gandhi's Sabarmati Ashram. He was uh, inspired by, uh, by uh, you know, the, the Gulab Bagh or whatever Bagh in Nagpur. And so, uh, so they are born in, but not born of. In one case, there's a man who brought the best of the world to Gujarat. And in another case, there's a man who brought the worst of the world to Gujarat. And yet both speak of nationalism. They both claim to be nationalists, very different kind of nationalists. Can you try and contrast their two ideas of India and nationalism? Yeah, uh, when the French Revolution took place, the, the three words were liberty, fraternity, equality. Uh, the idea of nation became very strong after Napoleonic Wars. And some of the European nations went for nationalism, uh, particularly Italy in the 1830s and Germany in the 1860s. With Bismarck, Germany became nation. But some other European nations took the idea of liberty. For instance, Ireland. The Irish, uh, Irish uh, struggle was uh, Sinn Féin, 
uh, and uh, it was not national nationalist struggle. It was the struggle for home rule. Uh, Sinn Fein movement came to India through Annie Besant later, which Tilak accepted for a few years. We had home rule league in India. Uh, our struggle is called independence struggle. What I'm saying is the countries which harped on the idea of nation in the 19th century ended up in the mid 20th century as fascist nations. Those that were inspired by the idea of freedom, they had to fight these fascist nations. Now, uh, Gandhi, Tagore, and Aurobindo, three great leaders, three great thinkers of the 20th century who right. were at the forefront of the nationalist movement very well knew the dangers of excessive nationalism and therefore while Tagore uh, who, uh, who uh, wrote uh, and whose poem we use for, as a national anthem and not just us but Bangladesh and Sri Lanka music of the national anthem goes from Tagore. Tagore chose to establish Vishwa Bharati not, not Desha Bharati, not Rashtra Bharati. Similarly with Gandhi, Gandhi was extremely fond of two institutions he created. One was the Sabarmati Ashram. The second was Gujarat Vidyapit. He said Gujarat Vidyapit is for training students to participate in the national freedom struggle. But with Sabarmati Ashram, he said that is a place to train minds to take ideas of non-violence and, uh, non -violence and truth forward. Sabarmati Ashram was not seen within a national context. Gujarat Vidyapit was. Gandhi decided that uh, Gandhi felt that after independence, he might as well go to Pakistan and stay there. He would be at, I mean, at home there in order to bring about uh, communal harmony. With Aurobindo, who had uh, participated in 1907, uh, 1998, uh, nationalist struggle in, after Wanga uh, and was imprisoned for that. And uh, he had actually conceptualized Bharat Maka Mandir, the, the mother, uh, mother India's temple. Right. The last piece he wrote in 1950, he died in 1950, December. In February, he did the last piece of writing at the age of 78. And that piece was saying that the creation of the United Nations in 1949 was a great thing. And the world must become a, a federation of small nations, but one thing, a one governance. No separate nation is necessary for the ultimate spiritual upliftment of humanity. Three great minds refuse the idea of nationalism almost before India became a nation because they were wiser. Now this excessive nationalism of Mr. Modi and Hindutva nationalism is Could based you, um, on... I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you just briefly. When you say excessive nationalism, where is the excess? Uh, if It would help if you could define that. Well, the excess is in action. Uh, that is, at the slightest criticism of the idea, uh, the, that, uh, the, the, the holders of that idea, the advocates of that idea feel um, challenged, threatened. And anybody who criticizes is dis immediately described as one who is outside the idea of nation that is anti-national. So th that 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 excess is seen in action. How how often the term is used? How often it is used? Uh, quite uh, lightly. Uh, to, uh, the, the, there is a case of a very famous case of a former prime minister who had uh, a chai or dinner with uh, some gentleman from Pakistan once. And it is perfectly fine if, if you are, if when you are in the international politics, international scene, your friends from uh, various countries, uh, for, for instance, uh, there can be a prime minister who suddenly, uh, who's gone off to Iran and is returning to India and suddenly halfway through feels that he should land in Pakistan, have, uh, go and shake hands with the prime minister. I think that's very civilized, uh, and such a such an action should be admired. So th there was a prime minister who had a guest at his place, uh, and uh, because uh, because Punjab uh, uh, at one time was neither India nor Pakistan; it was Punjab. Indeed, and, uh, yes. 
some of the gurus were born in on that side of the border some were born on this side of the border some of the poets on that side of the border so, so it's all mix of history uh, so immediately even a prime minister former prime minister was labeled as anti national that is excess nationalism or uh, an admiral or a field marshal or a general or a judge or a great professor or a great thinker a nobel prize winner they are all they can be um, you know labeled branded as anti national that is excess nationalism that was your question uh, i will return to your first question that nationalism is founded on an idea of history which in itself is non scientific uh, idea of history in that non scientific idea of history uh, the the break that came after the indus civilization in 1900 before christ up to 1400 before christ is ruled out the the historians of climate uh, ecology tell us that actually those 600 years where the times and the nights became very cold days were very hot and therefore desert desertification took place water shortage acute water shortage uh, made uh, the city life uh, non viable and therefore cities got dissolved the uh, the indus civilization cities uh, the kind of uh, uh, chipped off fell apart and people started wandering the hindutva idea of history thinks that even those and then 500 years later came the uh, indic language or what we call the indo aryan language mm -hmm. it came from the steps Uh, the eurasian steps had people who knew how to run carts tying to tied to horses and in moving carts with great speed if you throw arrows or uh, the the lethal capacity increases therefore they were more effective and uh, that's how they came here they were nomadic types they had no idea of city life they uh, they brought another language uh, to us the rss uh, wants to say that the indus civilization also had the sanskrit language and the vedas are much older than what the vedas themselves say uh, right they are holding seminars to determine the date birth date of uh, bhagwan krishna i mean i really respect bhagwan krishna a very wise person very uh, very uh, ex, uh, very uh, absorbing uh, uh, philosopher uh, but to determine the date his birth date is a difficult task because when he came here he came as an avatar that means it was not the original birth the original birth was elsewhere so we don't know when the original birth was so so to to determine the date of birth of uh, krishna uh, then the, on the basis of that mahabharat on the basis of supposing the date of birth of uh, that great god turns out to be a particular then everybody born on that date can become avatar of krishna in our time also i mean all kinds of things uh, th that idea of history is not scientific history <coughs> it is not uh, uh, supported by archaeology sufficiently well it is not supported by genetics sufficiently well a hundred genetics and archaeology scientists came together in 2019 led by david rick of harvard uh, school of uh, medic med school of medicine harvard university and produced a paper about the ancient movement of population in south asia because they felt greatly worried about the non scientific promotion of ninth non scientific view of history idea of nation on the founded on non science that is one and second uh, the idea of nation is founded on non recognition of diversities our constitution defines india very clearly india i mean uh, when you open the constitution immediately your eyes fall on a sentence which reads india which is a union india that is bharat is a union of states that is the states must unite to create india uh, india does not precede the states the states precede the, the idea of india is that uh, we all come together uh, and unless that diversity is recognized 
uh, India does not become the India that is enshrined in the constitution. But this nationalism is founded on uh, a certain uh, desire to reject uh, some of the founding principles of the constitution. So it is uh, non-scientific, non-constitutional. And finally, uh, it is uh, quite far from any humanitarian engagement with humans as they are. Uh, for instance, in uh, on the first day of we became the republic, everybody who was here became citizen. Once and we became equal citizens, whether they were Jews, whether they were Parsis, they were Sikhs, who, whichever religion, they all became citizens of India. Once that question is sorted out, allowing Indians to get beyond caste, beyond religion, be humans at equal, be modern, be progressive, be great. Once that is resolved in 1950, revisiting it, creating new laws for citizenship, uh, which are disc uh, which are uh, not evenly uh, create not created evenly for everybody. Uh, discriminatory laws are created. Attitudes are expressed. Actions follow. Uh, calls for genocides are given quite openly. Hate speech is promoted. Nobody takes uh, any uh, action to curb that. All of that, if that is the idea of nationalism, certainly I or anyone can call it excessive nationalism. We need certain awareness of being a nation to remain united, to conduct our affairs. But to take it to this extent, um, the smacks of uh, things beyond the framework of the constitution, framework of civilization, and framework of social norms. All three frameworks were also recently very starkly violated when we saw the uh, the people who had abused Bilkis Bano and her family, the people who had raped her and who had murdered members of her family were actually let free on remission. Now, what would Gandhi have thought if such an action that had taken place in his time in front of him today? Gandhi uh, was a trained barrister and he really respected law. And he would have he would have taken recourse to legal remedy. Uh, now in the, the other case where Tista settled what was arrested, Supreme Court just said that, oh, this is a conspiracy. Therefore, these people who are asking for justice must be uh, punished. Uh, but uh, in this in this case, Gandhi would have written a letter to the Chief Minister of Gujarat, made an appeal to his conscience, would have written a letter to the uh, President of India and Prime Minister of India. He would have sat on a fast. He would have gone to the family of Bilkis Banu. He would, would have gone to Bilkis Banu's house and uh, sat there and uh, he would have uh, you know, uh, spent time there and cried with her. Uh, to show that there is some humanity, uh, he would have applied to the Supreme Court once again to revisit this case, open it. If that is not done, Gandhi would have moved other courts, international courts of justice. Uh, but Gandhi, in the face of injustice, uh, always wanted not just to get justice, or to challenge the perpetrator, but also to turn the perpetrator into a human being. Gandhi had a firm faith that the worst among the perpetrators also can be through an appeal, through a moral appeal, uh, can be uh, brought to see where they lack humanity. He would have done that. And could uh, that be... By fighting... Uh, in a shrill tone, in a way we acknowledge that the perpetrators are at the same moral level that we are. Gandhi, uh, Gandhi knew how to uh, how to put in a corner, you know, the perpetrator by making a moral appeal, uh, but not uh, not a physical, not application of physical or any other force, just the moral force, just the spiritual force. That was Gandhi. And 
would that sort of help us explain also why we find, for example, Gandhi is not the person they picked, this government picked to put under the canopy at India Gate. When they decided to choose a person, they chose someone whom Gandhi himself had not at one point chosen. Could that yeah. sort of be an explanation that they want to, if not erase, then efface the legacy? No, Bose, Bose uh, is an admirable uh, uh, personage in our history. Very fascinating, uh, brilliant, uh, courageous, imaginative, and both both uh, 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 should get what he deserves. That's a different thing. But uh, when Gandhi's method started looking ineffective, some of his friends argued with him. And they said that another method should be uh, adopted. There is a long correspondence with Gandhi, uh, uh, of his friends with Gandhi, about uh, the futility of Gandhian methods to fight Hitlerism. There is also a correspondence with Gandhi about his methods to fight imperialism, colonialism. The futility and the Hind Swaraj itself is that great debate about which is a better method. Now Gandhi, uh, Gandhi was Gandhi's method was seen as inadequate some of, by some people in the 1940s as inadequate to fight colonialism, inadequate to fight fascism. Both Hitler and his fascism are dumped, were dumped and forgotten, and the name became, uh, you know, attached with shame. Colonialism got dismantled, uh, and within a few years after the British left India, all over in Africa, in East Asia, in Latin America, colonialism was a word of the past and a word that people wanted to forget. But Gandhi's ideas remained there. People never wanted to forget those. People could not follow the ideas. But nobody, even Gandhi's worst enemy, has not said that Gandhi was a bad man. Gandhi's ideas were dangerous. Nobody, nobody ever said that. Uh, they People have mocked at him. People wanted to kill him. Some went and killed him. That's, but the world, by, I mean, uh, 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 in general, Never wanted to. In fact, uh, whenever the uh, question of uh, who who can we think of in the last hundred years or two hundred years as among the greatest human beings, if you ask ten or fifteen persons, Gandhi's name would figure in that list. It's another thing. He never got the Nobel Prize for Peace. He, uh, his application went there three or four times. It was, but uh, history will be uh, will do justice to Gandhi and what has happened to Gujarat uh, will change will change uh, people in Gujarat are also people they are also intelligent and they also see the reality I, I have worked with tribals in Gujarat Adivasis in Gujarat and I know how they feel about the regime uh, how students and professors and teachers in universities think about it now there are lots of agitations of teachers going on in Gujarat. You know, city staff is on strike. Uh, there is a farmer's agitation going on, the student agitation going on, the tribal agitation going on. There's a denotified and nomadic tribes uh, movement going on there. The theater persons, film persons, writers, Saitya Parishad, they're all against the government. Propaganda is not. Media is not. The, those who pay the media on behalf of the government, they are not against the government. That is a minority, uh, small number. Uh, things will change. And Gujarat one day will unitedly, I am very sure, unitedly stand up and say, not now, but 10 years, 15 years, whenever, in, in, but not too far a date, Gujarat will come together and say, uh, sorry, India. We troubled you a lot. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Devi, for joining us.